everybody. Welcome to Fellowship Church Bible Study, Sunday Night Bible Study. We will begin in just about four minutes. So while we are waiting to begin, please share this broadcast. Invite friends, family, and study. We are excited about this journey that we are embarking on tonight. So please like, share, invite someone to, to join you in our Bible study uh, tonight. I'll be back in about two minutes so we can start. All right. you on this evening. We're going to start in just one more minute, but welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for our Sunday night Bible study. It is so good to have all of you with us on tonight. Please share this broadcast. Invite somebody to watch this Bible study with you. When the Bible study is over, share it. Uh, with your family, your friends, and your foes. Remember, we are live on Facebook and on YouTube right now. So if your family does not have access to Facebook, direct them towards YouTube. If your family doesn't have access to YouTube, direct them towards Facebook. Please help us share this message that we are going to start on tonight. So again, 
welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on our Sunday night Bible study here at Fellowship Church. If this is your first time joining us, please type first time so that we can officially welcome you to the Fellowship Church family. We are so thankful to have you with us on tonight. Tonight is the night. I am so excited to begin this journey through the book of Acts. This series is called Acts, Work of the Spirit Changing the World. Work of the Spirit Changing the World. And so we are uh, going to go through the entire book of Acts starting tonight. There are over a, a thousand verses in the book of Acts, 28 chapters. We're going through every verse, every word, every sentence of the book of Acts starting tonight. So this journey uh, will take us, I'm sure, all the way to the end of the year and into next year. We're not going to rush through this study. We're not going to skip over anything. We are going to look deeply in all of the themes that are presented in the book of Acts. Uh, we're not going to skip over anything. Um, if something is controversial, we're going to deal with it. If it's uncomfortable, we're going to face it. This is the word of the Lord, and we are going to look at it line by line. So I invite you to open up your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts uh, with me, Acts chapter 1. Just so you know, uh, during this study, I am using the Christian Standard Version of the Bible. Uh, it is not necessary for you to use the same version of the Bible that I am using. Uh, it may be helpful so that you can see the exact wording that I am presenting to you, but it's not necessary. Use the version of Scripture uh, that you are most comfortable with. But uh, oftentimes people ask, what version of the scripture are you reading from? So for the purpose of this study, I am reading from the Christian standard version of scripture. In fact, I need to get my um, Bible in front of me. All right, are you ready? Let's uh, first look at the fact that the book of Acts was written A.D. 63 through 70. So what does that mean? The book of Acts was written A.D. through uh, A.D. 63 through six, uh, 70. Let me read what I have in here. A.D. 63 through 70. All right. So AD means last days or in times. So AD means last days or in times. AD begins after the death of Christ. But A.D. does not mean after death. Okay. A.D. begins after the death of Christ, but it does not mean after death. It means last days in times. So the book of Luke was written 63 to 70 years after 
the death of Christ. All right. So who wrote the book of Acts? First, before we look at specifically who wrote the book of Acts, let's acknowledge 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work, all right? So all scripture is inspired by God. So the book of Acts was inspired, breathed, therefore written by God and is profitable for teaching. So we look at the book of Acts to be taught. The book of Acts exists to teach us, but it's not just for teaching, it's for rebuking us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to be confronted. We need to be rebuked publicly or privately. It is also for correcting. Sometimes we need to make corrections. We need to be corrected. We are in error, so the book of Acts corrects us. Our thinking is in error, so the book of Acts corrects us. Our behavior is in error, so the book of Acts corrects us. And it's for training in righteousness. Come on. The book of Acts is for training in righteousness. The book of Acts trains us in doing the right thing. Right? And so that the man of God may be complete, equipped, for every good work, huh? So the book of Acts is to complete us and equip us for every good work. So know this, as we are going through the book of Acts, this is not a cognitive exercise only, but we're going through this journey through the book of Acts so that we can be equipped for every good work. We're going to do something with what we are taught through the book of Acts. Somebody type, do something, do something, do something, do something. If you're gonna go on this journey with us through the book of Acts, you must be prepared to do something. Don't waste your time just going through the exercise of studying this book if you are not prepared to do something. All right, so Acts chapter one, verse one, is where we begin to understand who wrote the book of Acts. Acts chapter one, verse one says, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So verse one, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So here we see that there is another narrative somewhere else, all right? So from this, it looks like the book of Acts was written to a man named Theophilus, 
okay? And the book of Acts is a second narrative written to a man named Theophilus, all right? So where is the first narrative? Because we still don't know who the author is. Well, if we look at Luke chapter one, verses one through four, it says, many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. So it also seemed good to me since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first to write to you an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, there's the name Theophilus again, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. So here, Luke explains to Theophilus that he is writing to him a narrative from the original eyewitnesses and that he has carefully investigated everything. So he's writing to Theophilus to give him an orderly sequence so that he may know with certainty the things which he has been instructed. So Luke, the book of Luke, the gospel according to Luke is a narrative that Luke wrote to Theophilus. All right, so look. So the book of Acts is the second narrative that Luke wrote to Theophilus. The first narrative that Luke wrote is the gospel according to Luke that was written to Theophilus. The book of Acts is the second narrative Luke wrote to Theophilus. All right, who was Luke? Luke Luke was a physician and the only Gentile to write any part of the New Testament. Did y'all know that? Luke is the only Gentile to write any part of the New Testament. That means he was not of Jewish descent. Luke was a close friend of Paul. Paul referred to Luke as the beloved physician. So Colossians 4, uh, 14 lets us know that Luke was a much loved physician. Perhaps Luke's interest in medicine is the reason his gospel gives such a high profile to Jesus's acts of healing. If you look through uh, the book of Luke or the gospel according to Luke, you will see much interest in the healings that Jesus performed. And maybe Luke focused on these miracles of healing because Luke was a physician. All right, who was Theophilus? We don't know much about 
Theophilus, uh, but it is suggested that Theophilus was most likely his patron or a wealthy person who funded Luke's research and writing of his two books, all right? So Luke's objective was to do research on what really happened. Now remember, this was written 63 to 70 years after the death of Christ. So there are still many people who were alive when Christ was alive, was crucified, rose again. Many of those people are still alive. So Luke is investigating what actually happened. And it is thought that Theophilus paid for Luke's research. Hmm? Just like now, if, if I'm a scientist or even a historian and, and I want to do some research, uh, I want to research something, do some scientific research. I need a patron. I need someone who will help fund that research. Well, if they're helping to fund the research, then I need to give them a report on what I have found. So if Theophilus funded Luke's research, then the book of Luke and the book of Acts is the report that Luke wrote to Theophilus, giving him what he discovered about Christ through his research. Hmm. All right? So, What is the narrative of Acts about, all right? Acts chapter one, verse one and two says, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, all right? So this tells us Luke, the gospel according to Luke is about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. Then he says, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So again, Luke is about all that Jesus began to do and teach until he was taken up. All right. So the first narrative is about what Jesus did before he returned back to heaven. The second narrative, which is the book of Acts, is about what happened with the apostles in the absence of Jesus, but empowered by the Holy Spirit. So the book of Acts is a narrative that explains what happened to the apostles after Jesus went back to heaven? What did they do? What did they experience? <clears throat> Excuse me, y'all. All right. Acts is unique because it links the gospels with the epistles by recording the birth and early history of the church. And the church is the expression of God's kingdom for this age. So the book of Acts is a special book because on one side of the book of Acts, we have the gospels. On the other side of the book of Acts, we have the epistles. The book of Acts is the missing link between the Gospels and the Epistles. 
eat. It connects them. It brings them together. It is the record or the recording of the birth of the church and its early history. The gospels is what the apostles heard. Acts is what the apostles did with what they heard. All right, Acts chapter one, verses three and four. After he had suffered, okay, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So Luke tells Theophilus, after Christ suffered, he presented himself alive to the apostles with many convincing proofs. According to Luke's research, Jesus presented himself to his apostles with many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. This wasn't a moment. This wasn't, we were all together and somebody thinks they saw an image of Christ in the cloud or a shadow in the room or they felt his presence. No, he spent 40 days speaking to them about the kingdom of God, giving them many convincing proofs. It wasn't a ghost. It wasn't their imagination. It wasn't wishful thinking. He spent 40 days with them, speaking to them about the kingdom. The resurrection was not wishful thinking on the part of the apostles. They were presented with many convincing proofs. I encourage you to read Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 46 for more information about that. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 46. All right, so Acts chapter one, verse three, says appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And just sit on this for a minute. These are the men who watched Christ suffer and die. Three days after they buried him, he appears to them alive. And for 40 days, he spent 40 days talking to them about the kingdom of God. Hmm. Tony Evans says, God's kingdom agenda is the unifying theme of scripture. We may define it as the visible manifestation of the comprehensive rule of God in every area of life. Thus, the church exists to serve King Jesus and his kingdom. Can I read that again? God's kingdom agenda is the unifying theme of scripture. We may define the kingdom of God as the visible 
manifestation of the comprehensive rule of God in every area of life. Thus, the church exists to serve King Jesus and his kingdom. Okay, so next we see the promise of the Holy Spirit. All right, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5 says, While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the Father's promise which he said, you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. All right, he says, wait for the Father's promise, which you've heard me talk about. This, this isn't new, all right? For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days, All right? So two commands for the disciples, don't leave and wait. Two commands, come on church, don't leave, wait. Somebody say, don't leave. Type in the comment section, don't leave wait. Somebody else type wait. Probably two of the most frustrating commands is don't leave, but wait. Imagine this. The, the apostle spent 40 days with the, resurrection, with the resurrected Jesus talking about the kingdom. Imagine that. They watched him die. He rose from the dead just like he said he would. And they spent a month and 10 days talking to the resurrected Christ. I can imagine that after 40 days of talking about the kingdom, they must have been pumped and ready to go. Like, come on, let's do this. We just spent the last 40 days talking to the resurrected Christ. Let's get this party started. But Jesus said, don't leave. I know you're excited, but wait. I know that what I've shared with you has inspired you and provoked you, but wait, you're not ready to go. I know you're anointed. I know you're appointed. I know you're on a spiritual high, but don't leave. Wait, <clears throat> it's not time for you to go. The apostles had knowledge about the kingdom of God, but they did not have the power needed to bring it to pass. Jesus spent 40 days talking to them about the kingdom of God, or oh, to be a fly on that wall. They had knowledge of the kingdom, but they did not have the power needed 
to bring it to pass. Therefore, sometimes knowledge is not power. I know there's a popular saying that says knowledge is power, but sometimes knowledge is not power. Sometimes only power is power. Come on, somebody say power is power. The apostles had knowledge about the kingdom of God. Jesus spent 40 days talking to them about the kingdom of God. But he said, don't leave, wait. You got, you got knowledge, but you don't have power. You need both. So he, he talks to them about two baptisms. Water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now the Greek word for baptism literally means dip or immerse. To dip or to immerse. The Greek word for baptism is B-A-P-T-I-D-Z-O. You see it on the screen and it literally means to dip or to immerse. So Jesus told his disciples, you were immersed in water. You will be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Wait, don't leave. You're not ready to go yet because you were immersed in water you will be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Don't leave until you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. The apostles were to wait in Jerusalem until they were immersed in the Holy Spirit. Man. Whew. This indicated the apostles' need for the Holy Spirit to bring about the kingdom of God. See, you got the kingdom of God in your mind. Now you need the kingdom of God in your spirit. Now, in, in Scripture, mind and and heart are the same so this isn't mind power this isn't heart power this is spirit to spirit because you got it in your mind you believe it in your heart but it has to get in your spirit Ooh come on somebody you got it in your mind, you believe it in your heart, but you need it in your spirit because the spirit drives everything you do. The, the spirit will drive you even when your heart begins to doubt. The, your spirit will drive you when your mind doesn't understand. Come on, the spirit pushes you beyond what your mind understands or your heart can believe. If you're going to do the kingdom of God's work, you need it in your spirit. Bringing about the kingdom agenda requires the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now they ask him a question about the kingdom. Funny disciples, skip right over the, the power conversation, baptism conversation. They ask a question about the kingdom. Acts chapter one, verse six, he says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you going to, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? See, they are still thinking that Christ came 
to restore the kingdom of Israel, to overtake the Roman Empire. They still don't get it that Jesus came to destroy the kingdom of darkness. He came to overthrow the kingdom of darkness. He didn't come to deliver Israel from the hand of the Roman Empire. He came to deliver Israel from the yoke and the bondage of sin, the oppression of sin, the torture, the agony of sin. So they asked him, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? Look at what Jesus said. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. It is not for you to know. Here's the lesson. It's going to help somebody. When serving the kingdom of God, there are some things that are not for us to know. I know that hurts your feelings. But there's some things that are not for you to know. There's some questions that you're going to ask God and he's not going to give you an answer because they're not for you to know. When are certain things going to change? Some of those things is not for you to know. Why certain things happen the way they did? Some of it, it's not for you to know. When you're serving the kingdom of God, you can ask all the questions you want to ask. Ask them early, ask them often, but understand that there are some things that are not for you to know. And you're going to have a problem working for the kingdom if you don't move unless you know the answers to all your questions. If you need understanding and information, if you need all your questions to be answered before you move in the kingdom of God, you're not going to be successful in kingdom work. When serving the kingdom of God, there are some things that are not for us to know. All right, verse eight, this is the last verse we're going to talk about on tonight. He says, listen, it's not for you to know the times that the Father has in his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. You won't know everything, but you have the power to do everything. Come on, somebody. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Good news. You will receive power to be my witnesses. Power <clears throat> in the King James Version is almost always translated authority. Power is almost always translated as authority, all right? So authority is power, ability, or capability to complete an action, okay? Authority power, ability, or capability to complete an action. Authority can be delegated. Hmm? So you can do things in someone else's name. I can give you the authority to conduct business in my name. If I give you, what is it called? It just slipped my mind. Power of attorney. 
I think that's what it's called. But that gives you the authority to conduct business in somebody else's name. Church, we have been given the authority, the delegated authority to conduct business in God's name. That's what it says. And all that you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus, under the authority of Jesus. The apostles were given delegated authority by the Holy Spirit. And he says, don't leave Jerusalem until you have been authorized by the Holy Spirit to do so. You are going to receive the authority, the ability, the capability to complete the work of the kingdom. So wait until you have been authorized. Some of us are moving and functioning in kingdom work that we have not been authorized to do. And we're struggling and we're failing in it because we're trying to do something we haven't been authorized to do. It's never going to work if you haven't received delegated authority to complete the assignment. You cannot work in the kingdom. You can't go through the catalog of kingdom assignments and pick out what you want and think that's going to be successful. No, you have to be authorized. Listen, the power of the Holy Spirit in this text is for effective witness. He says, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. That means you cannot be my witness until you have been authorized, until you've been given the authority. The Holy Spirit gives the apostles ability capability to complete the action of witnessing in their delegated authority. The Holy Spirit authorized the apostles to conduct the business of the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus says, don't leave, wait until you receive authorization to conduct kingdom business. The Holy Spirit authorizes us to tell others what we have witnessed. We are to tell what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've experienced. The Holy Spirit gives our witness credibility. If you call a witness to the stand, in order for that witness to be an effective witness, they must be credible. And they can only tell what they saw, what they heard, and what they experienced. Mm, mm, mm. We're watching the trial of George Floyd right now. And these witnesses are giving credible testimony because they're talking about what they saw, what they heard, and what they experienced. 
And that's what our job is as kingdom citizens. Our job is to tell what we saw, what we heard, what we experienced. When Luke was doing his research, he took note of the eyewitnesses, what they saw, what they heard, what they experienced. When you go out into the world, you don't have to know how to quote every scripture. You don't need a seminary degree. All you need to do is tell what you saw, what you heard, whew, and what you experienced. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses. Jesus is going back to heaven and he says, I've enjoyed these 40 days I've spent with you, but I, I got to go now. And I want you to wait because there's something you haven't experienced. You, you've experienced the water baptism, but you haven't experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I don't want you to go out into this world to be my witnesses until after you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the authority to be his witnesses. So this week, pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the ability to be an effective witness for Christ, that he will empower you to tell what you saw, what you heard, and what you experienced. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for your word tonight. I thank you for this report that was left by Luke, the beloved physician, so that we can see how through the power of the Holy Spirit, you use the apostles to change the world. I thank you that even our lives are being changed because the apostles said what they saw, what they heard, and what they experienced. And it's their witness that has given us hope. God, I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would give us the grace to tell what we saw, what we heard, and what we have experienced so that others will come to know you because of our witness. Thank you, Lord, that we are effective witnesses for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me tonight on our uh, Sunday night Bible study, our first part of our journey through the book of Acts. On next week, we will uh, pick up at verse number nine. We'll try to get through the remainder of uh, chapter one. Maybe not, probably not, more than likely not. 
Uh, again, I'm taking my time um, as we go through this. No rush, but go ahead and read the remainder of the book of uh, the first chapter of the book of Acts. If you have questions, please feel free to email me, contact me during the week. I'll be happy to uh, answer your questions either uh, via your email or I will answer your question during one of our Sunday night Bible studies. All right. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time for your daily bread on Facebook Live. God bless you. Remember, I love you so much. You don't even know it. God bless you. Be well. See you soon.